Hey, Lem Listers, I'm super happy to be joined today with Jill Rowley, also known as the Queen of Sales. For those of you who don't know Jill yet, she worked at companies like Salesforce among first 100 employees, Eloqua, number, employee number 13, HubSpot, and tons of other companies. So mind-blowing track record, having been a top performing sales rep anywhere she went. Jill, thanks a lot for accepting my invitation. Oh, I'm excited to be here. <laughs> so before I actually start asking you tons of questions, Jill, uh, I just wanted to ask everyone who's live on the community right now, just to answer and uh, let us know if you can hear us well, if the sound is good, the image is good, if uh, everything is fine. Also, I want to remind you that it's uh, really fun and fun if you can uh, start asking questions um, during the live. So we will basically like stop my question and have yours so, so Jill can, uh, can jump in. So I'm just going to make sure that everything's good. Um, so guys, yeah, just comment if, uh, if, if it's good. Um, um, waiting for the, for the signals, uh, if I have someone. Okay, so apparently <laughs> it should be fine. Um, so Jill, we're facing kind of a global crisis with uh, coronavirus. And I was wondering if you could share your point of view with our audience about whether or not they should keep prospecting and also how should they do it, you know, in a, in a time of crisis? Yeah, sure. So I, you know, I always say pipeline saves lives. Um, so it, it, I think that there's always a, a, a behavioral requirement, a habit, a routine of um, really understanding who your ideal customers are mm -hmm. and who are the right people within organizations um, to have the conversations with and um, to understand timing, right? Timing is really important. So um, if you are selling into the restaurant industry, yeah. Um, now is probably not a time to be selling software into the restaurant industry, yeah, um, the travel industry, right? One of the companies that I advise, uh, one of our early customers sells into the travel industry and they just had massive layoffs. Um, so now is not a good time to be prospecting into the travel industry. Um, I think it's important to really take the, the, the lens of the customer, right? To understand and have empathy for um, what they're going through and what they need at this point in time. Um, I think it's a great time to be um, having early conversations. If mm -hmm. in fact, you know that they are in your ideal customer profile and eventually could be a good customer for you. Um, now's not a time to be sending generic spam templated cadences, series sequences to random people because you were able to acquire quickly and easily their email addresses. Mm -hmm. So it's not a time for um, um, uh, anything that isn't very specific, very intentional, very personalized, very relevant, and very value-based. Okay. So essentially, like 100% uh, agree with, uh, with what you said, but I just want to dig maybe a, a little more uh, deep into like the... Um, so you're saying that you could reach out to people, for example, not not in a sense of uh, doing sales, but more in a sense of trying to help them and uh, figure out like uh, maybe what their issue. Would you like um, try to get in touch first with, let's say like uh, you you took the the example of uh, of restaurants as your ideal customer profile. Would you first try to maybe like reach out to existing customers and try to understand really their pain before trying to reach out to others, or what? How would you proceed? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost protecting your base okay. and um, connecting with your customers, your existing customers who are paying you money and um, might actually need um, a, a pause on paying you. Yeah. Uh, for example, this is a, a consumer example, but I work out at Orange Theory Fitness. I'm a huge Orange, Orange Theory <laughs> fan. I love the workout. It, it just, it works for me. I've been doing it for two and a half years. I freaking love Orange Theory. <laughs> nice. um, now is not the time to be going to a gym and sweating yeah. all over the equipment and potentially spreading COVID-19 around. Um, what 
Orange Theory, our particular franchise, it is a franchise, so they're individually owned. They paused our memberships. Okay. So they're not charging us right now for access to the gym because there is no access to the gym. Nice. However, in my area in Charleston, South Carolina, there are competing gyms that are still charging their customers, even though they don't, hmm. their customers don't have access to the gym. Yeah. They're putting virtual workouts online and saying that's what you're paying mm. for. Okay. So there's there's a different approach to how you how you handle what you're going to do for your customers. And I can tell you, my neighbor, who's a member at this competing gym, she's yeah. not happy Yeah. with the approach. I'm empathetic to Orange Theory. Of course, they can't open the gym. It's a, we're on lockdown. Um, they are providing virtual workouts, but they're not charging for those because they don't compare. Mm. That's really interesting. I really like the, because my gym is actually like charging me. Uh, right now so it's it's not as if you know they reach out to say like guys it's closed we're not going to charge you like they're charging me um however i think like um, your point makes a lot of sense so essentially first of all the first step is really like reach out to your existing customers make sure like to know them know their challenges understand them um and actually like what you mentioned and i think it's great because you mentioned your neighbor saying that she's unhappy currently which means that's if she was unhappy and you started talking to her, obviously you said, look, my gym, they're not charging me because this is a good gym. So eventually she'll make the switch. So that's super interesting also because it's, uh, it's you know, about like word of mouth. Word of mouth is super important in sales. We know that. And sometimes even like focusing on your customers, reaching out to them can help you in the future to acquire more customers through referral. So that's, uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't even say word of mouth anymore. Yeah. I say okay. world, world <laughs> of mouth. Because yeah, guess true. what? There are Orange Theory fitness gyms in London and mm. they're they're all over the globe. And so if anyone's listening now and is a member of a gym and a gym that's charging them for no value being delivered, yeah. they might say, you know what? When this is over, I'm going to Orange Theory. Nice. <laughs> I like that. No, that's true. That's very true. Um now I want to take a step back a little bit. So um, your career is like super impressive. You you were one of the first hundred employees at Salesforce, which is I think pretty huge when you look at how the company is. Um, basically, like in the community, we have a lot of people starting in sales. And what I what I like is essentially like um, prior to joining Salesforce, if I remember correctly, you had no prior professional sales experience and sales training. So I'd love to know, and maybe if you can share a little bit how it was uh, for you, you know, as a first sales experience working at Salesforce, what could be your advice? What are the things, you know, you could have done differently or you, you, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, I, I will say that my education, my university education <clears throat> was incredible preparation for my career path. So I, um, I'm actually the first in my family to get a four-year degree. Um, nice. My dad was one of seven children and he lived in a house with one bathroom and no lock on the door. Okay. Um, my mom was a only child and um, sadly her father committed suicide when she was um, a young teenager. Um, they married young um, and my dad went into the Navy and my mom didn't go to college because she um, got pregnant and couldn't go to college because of that. So I'm actually first in my family to get a four-year degree. And I grew up in Virginia. I say I grew up more hick than hip. I grew up in a small town, a public high school, and um, was really, really fortunate to get really great grades in school and work super hard and get accepted to the University of Virginia, Wahoo Wah. Um, <laughs> I knew immediately I wanted to um, go down the business, the mm -hmm. undergraduate business school program path. Um, it was your first two years are general study. And then your second two years are in this um, separate undergraduate business program where the ratio of professor to student was much smaller. Um, there was a lot of group work and a lot of like case study, real practical application. 
Um, we didn't have classes on Friday. So that was also like a huge selling point because Thursdays <laughs> were my big night out. Um, big bar night on Thursday, um, big fraternity party night on Thursday. Um, so no having no classes on Friday, but the Friday was reserved for group work. Okay. Right. So it wasn't good selling that you, point. <laughs> yeah, totally. Good selling point at UVA. Um, and I, I, I thrived in that environment. I loved learning about business. I loved the curriculum of learning about management, entrepreneurialism, leadership, marketing, computer science, finance, accounting. I just loved all aspects of it. Um, and when I, when I graduated, I was definitely, I was on my own. The minute I graduated, all the bills were mine to pay. So I needed to get a, a high paying um, mm -hmm. career job. Yeah, job. Yep. And I didn't want to go to Wall Street. I thought New York was too big of a stretch for me having grown up in a really small town. I wasn't ready for New York. And on the flip side, um, consulting was a great opportunity for me to go and learn um, about different industries, different matters, different um, geographies. And I had heard that in consulting, you could get on travel projects and basically live in corporate housing Monday to Friday and then travel on the weekends. So I spent six years in consulting, which nice. is problem solving, which mm -hmm. is doing discovery, which is building models, which is doing client engagement. So when I, when I was ready to make the pivot out of consulting and into sales, and this is, I was in the Bay Area when yeah. I made the pivot, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I felt like I didn't need professional mm. sales training yeah, okay. because I had been using my brain, which to me, professional sales is about solving business problems for your customers. And so I didn't, I didn't see why me not having any sales experience on my resume was such a negative, but it was, I couldn't even get interviews because really? I didn't have the Whoa. experience. <laughs> yes. Which was crazy. So how and did you really, get into Salesforce? <laughs> so um, I went to a physical networking get together okay. at the apartment of a UVA alum. Okay. So being out in the Bay Area, being a UVA alum, that's a small group of people, especially back in 1999, 2000. Um, and I went to his house. He had invited some folks over. And it happened that this guy, Drew Seacrest, who was one of the first, you know, 10, 15, 20 employees at Salesforce, was there. And he heard me talk and saw my personality and related <laughs> to my passion and said, we're you hiring. Job. <laughs> nice. And so he did though, he said, look, it's gonna be, you You don't, the, the, the pushback is gonna be that you don't have any experience. Mm. And so I went to my best friend, Google, and searched Google for, Sales 101, professional selling, software sales, buying signals, objection handling, <laughs> like just read a freaking book on sales. <laughs> and then in the interview process, when the head of HR said, well, you know, the big concern, you don't have any experience in sales. I'm like, you're right. You knew that when you get, you know, when you invited me in for the interview. So what's it going to take? for me to show you that I have the necessary skills and the curiosity and the tenacity to do the job. So nice. I applied selling skills in the interview. She's mm -hmm. like, woo, what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's good. No, I think it's, it's really smart. So it's like, uh, be ready, like know your flows and try to like over, like compensate, learn new things and, uh, and go out uh, and um, how was it, you know, in the in the early days? So when you joined the team and uh, starting selling, because learning from books is definitely great. It gives you like strong foundation, but it's still like theory, you know, like you only learn by doing, I think. So right. how was it? Yeah, a hundred percent. So uh, we, <clears throat> fortunately, the way that we were organized as a sales team, we yeah. were literally on top of each other. So there was no, you know, six feet of social distancing <laughs> happening. <laughs> You were, you were literally like in a line 
um, almost like an assembly line, but it wasn't a handoff. So you were surrounded by your peers. And I, I mean, this is the luck of the draw. I sat right kitty corner to the number one sales rep at Salesforce. So okay. Carl Hubble, nice. I listened to all of his conversations. I was a sponge. I still am like, I will read, I will outread you. I will out listen to podcasts. I will out watch videos. I will out, you know, do research on Twitter and build tweet lists. And I mean, I'll out, I'll, I'll outwork anybody, <laughs> right? Or at least I used to, I'm 47. I'm, I'm less in the can do it and more in the conduit stage of my career. I'm nice. not the one who's actually doing all of the work anymore. I'm more the conduit to help people get what they want. Mm -hmm. But um, so I would listen to Carl Hubble. I, I use my internal resources at Salesforce. I met the product marketing team, the product management team. I wasn't afraid of executives. I've just never really been afraid to have conversations with people. I think that we're all just people. Like nice. even if I met Oprah Winfrey today or Michelle Obama or anyone else that I have great admiration for, yeah. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't feel insecure and I wouldn't feel insignificant and I wouldn't feel, um, I would be excited. I would feel gratitude and I would feel um, excitement more than I would feel any insecurity around having a conversation with someone. Nice. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's the best approach. I mean, especially I think it's a quality to have in sales, you know, because in sales, sometimes, you know, you're going to have people reject you a lot. So if you just think that, you know, people are people and that's it and, and move on, I think it's uh, literally like the best mindset to have. Um, yeah. And I would say, you know, beyond listening to my peers, um, I've, I've always been curious about customers, right? So I would, I would go into salesforce.com and I would, I was a, I loved, I love databases and CRM and analytics and reporting and all of that. So I could go in and I could run a report of who, who were our customers, right? I could see what the biggest deals were that were getting done. And I could understand like, what is, what is this great customer of ours look like? And then from a, you know, back then digital wasn't everything. There was a lot of physical. So there were a lot of um, um, stacks of article reprints of, of re, re, um, articles that were getting written in the Wall Street Journal or um, any, any customer case studies. I, I was just a sponge. I, I read everything. So I was able to use our, our CRM system to understand mm -hmm. and look at how did we get customers? Who are our customers? Um, how long did the process take? And I was also just a sponge for reading everything I could that was being written about Salesforce, about our customers, about our products, et cetera. Nice. No, that's, that's great. I have um, a few questions from the audience, so I'm just going to jump on that now because uh, otherwise <laughs> at the end we won't have time. Um, um, okay, so the question was, um, whenever you're sending like the initial email to, to one of your prospects, would you go for, because um, as you said, you know, like whenever you reach out, you do a lot of research. I think that was uh, definitely one of your strengths because the more you research, the more you understand the prospect needs, and then your email is much more tailored, much more personalized. So would you go for a really like short email or would you go with a, a longer one that shows kind of your expertise on a specific topic, especially on the initial one? Maybe you can discuss follow-ups after, but uh, for now it's uh, just the, the initial one, yeah. Yeah, so first and foremost, I don't use the word prospect. Okay. <laughs> I don't, I, I just, I don't, I don't like the word prospect. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I think words are really important and they set the tone. And so I don't, I, I, I've literally like no prospects, no prospecting. And I think of them as future advocates. Nice. I think of them as future advocates of my company, the solution product that I'm delivering and of me, Jill Rowley, right? So I think of them as, as future friends and pals and colleagues mm -hmm. and, <laughs> partners and and so the way that I think is really a big part of I think my success it's not just the things that I do but it's a mindset that I have yeah. and the language that I use so and instead of using the word prospect I just call them buyers I found yes. that that's okay. a more neutral term mm -hmm. um and and buyers you know 
I always think of them as they might not be buying from me now, but there's a potential that they can down the road. Mm -hmm. Or if they're not going to buy from me, uh, they might know someone who will. They might bump into someone who could influence that purchase decision. So I, I really believe that every interaction that you have actually matters and that it can have an impact either directly or indirectly. So getting back to buyers and how do you reach out? <laughs> um, yes, I do spend probably an inordinate amount of time doing research, um, but I am better able to craft the message to be about that human being, mm-hmm. that person working at that company. Maybe it's something I learned about that company, that person working at that company in that specific industry. Maybe it's something about that industry. And I feel that 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 one, I can I can get a better narrative and 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 make it more about them than me. Mm-hmm. Um, but also too, it, it just gives me more confidence when I reach out. Yeah. The more I know about that human being, the more confident I feel about the conversation. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. Um, Because I'm still quoting sales, right? Mm -hmm. So I just signed on to be an advisor of a company called Loop VOC, VOC Voice of the Customer. And 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 the opportunity matches to everything that I'm about right now. So I love B2B SaaS, software as a service. I'm all about it. Um, It's a female founder. Lauren Colbertson is the female founder. So I'm super pumped to finally be advising, (laughs) coaching, mentoring my first female founder. Um, She's in Charleston, South Carolina, where I live. So there's actually a female founder of a B2B (laughs) SaaS company here in Charleston, South Carolina. (laughs) Um, And I said in the category that I love, voice of the customer, you know, I say I was born sales, bread marketing, I believe customer. Mm -hmm. I am all about the customer. Right. So anyways, we're in a fundraising mode. Um, we run out of cash and May. And so I reached out to the like he's on the Midas list of Forbes venture capitalist. I know him because he was on the board of Eloqua. Okay. I've actually scouted deals for him in B2B SaaS cloud. I send Byron the note. And tell Byron, I just listened to him do an interview with Jason Lemkin at Saster on the current state of venture capital given COVID-19 and the coronavirus. I woot woot high-fived him on you know, the information that he shared, said that we, not they, we have a lot to learn from him, including me in the learning. Mm-hmm. And then said, hey, five to seven minutes of your time. I've got a female founder, voice of the customer. Knowing that he's an investor in two companies that touch yeah. this technology and 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 made the ask made the ask for his time Mm -hmm. he responded introducing me to junior investor at bessemer fine i go to my best friend google i search the junior investor's name i find an 11 minute video of him talking about ending poverty i listen and watch the video So when I reply, thank Byron, move him to BCC and meet this other person, I talk about eradicating poverty is going to be even harder given where we are today. So he responds quickly to that message because I made it about him, not about giving him a a link to the investor deck, telling him to listen Mm -hmm. to Lauren's podcast. I can get to that. Yeah. But first, I want him to know that I care about him. Mm -hmm. I'm going to listen to him. I'm going to come into this conversation understanding him. That's critical. So when you are reaching out at any point in the process, whether that's early and trying to get the first initial look, or it's mid when you're trying to get re-engaged and get deeper and, and meet more of maybe the buying committee and get, get the trust to be introduced to more people in the buying committee, always 
always don't touch touch base circle back check in mm -hmm. without thinking about something of value that you can deposit to that that person that you're engaging with yeah i'm i'm super aligned with uh, everything you said first of all i think like um, even if even though i use the term uh, prospects actually um, at lemlist we used i think i told you last time but uh, we don't call them prospect we call them buddies to be which also buddies stands to for, be. <laughs> it's to be, for buddies to be yeah, exactly <laughs> so we're like okay it's it's pretty smooth and yeah definitely in your outreach i really like the the way you've outlined things uh, being about them giving them context explaining you having like a clear cta in the first approach and then no matter you know how it goes sometimes you know the person replies by making an intro to other people i think it uh, it gives really like I just want to jump in on a, another question from uh, Magdalena and Anna. Actually, they have the, the same question. So that's why I think it's, it might be nice to, to answer it. So basically, like uh, you're also a mom uh, on top of having like a, an amazing sales career. So how was it, you know, to, to manage both? Because we know like mom can be like really a full time job. So how did you manage both? What were kind of your challenges and uh, how, how did you, you know, like succeed? Yeah. Uh, wow. Sometimes I look back and like, how did we get through it? Seriously, <laughs> because we lived in the Bay area and, um, we had four kids and I'm not only a mom, I'm a stepmom. So when my husband and I started dating, his kids were one, four and five. Okay. Well, one, four and five when we started dating in 1999. So um, and I, I didn't ever want to be a step parent. Um, I wasn't sure I wanted to be a wife first because I just, you know, my mom and dad divorced when I was five, both of my parents remarried different people. When I was 10, my mom second divorce when I was 13, third marriage when I was 16. So I just hadn't seen a lot of good and I'm much, yeah. I'm a pattern mm -hmm. recognition kind of person. Yeah, definitely. So the pattern yeah. wasn't looking good. <laughs> it, was not, it was not so right? good. <laughs> it wasn't looking so good. So I'm like this whole, I'm not sure I believe in marriage because I haven't seen it really work. Um, mm -hmm. And I had been a step daughter, had, you know, step dads and a step mom. And I just, I knew how hard that job was. So, um, but you can't help who you fall in love with. Um, and, um, and so I, you know, I, I, I took on three children and we had joint custody of his three kids. And then ultimately we had full custody of his three kids. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, we then, my daughter is 15. And so we had, uh, you know, Philip was 10 when Lily Kate was a baby. So I had a range of kids from, you know, couple days to 10 years old. And, um, and one of the things that, that I knew was important is that we had to have help. So yeah. I had a nanny who okay. was amazing. Um, and she, she helped not only manage uh, the kids, but she helped manage the house and all that goes along with, ultimately we moved from a nice quaint, small manageable house to a big house on the hill that in hindsight I don't know if I would do that again um <laughs> it was more than we needed okay but um but you know I just I had people who could help so but even back backing up before that um I married the right person right I married someone who um, supported me, uh, emotionally supported me from a, you can do this, um, was, gave me incredible career advice, saw things that I didn't even see because he knew me so well. And he, he did all the grocery shopping. Um, he did the cooking. If, you know, when we, when we got later in into things and we didn't have a full-time nanny anymore. Mm -hmm. um, my husband took on a lot of the responsibilities, even while huge career traveling, 
uh, we just, it wasn't just assumed that I was the one who was responsible for all the, the house and the homemaking and the motherly things. Um, so I married someone who was incredibly supportive and willing to share in, in, the, in, the, in the family responsibilities, um, got help where we needed help, right? Outsourced and, 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 and had nannies to help. Um, and, um, and then I just worked, I, again, I, I, will, I was able at that stage of my life and my career to outwork anybody else. Nice. I would work more hours than the average bear. No, that's that's really really cool story, and uh, I mean, it feels like you have uh, really figured out everything. I think it's really like uh, something you can't accomplish on your own. That's what uh, for me is a key learning from what you said. Like it's uh, it's important to surround yourself with uh, people that know you, understand you also, and are happy to help and give a hand when needed. So, yeah, congratulations on on all of that because I I'm sure it must have been like a really like uh, amazing challenge all all along this years. Yeah, it wasn't easy. I mean, there were many mornings where we were running out the door with, you know, a, a frozen waffle that had been heated in the microwave or um, uh, cinnamon toast and you know, asking the bus driver to wait a minute to get my daughter on the bus. And there were, you know, as soon as our oldest could drive, he got a car because I needed him to drive his brother to school. Mm. Like we just, we worked as a family unit and nice. I would, I would say that, you know, the kids probably wish that mom and dad, stepmom and dad had been home more. Um, I definitely know that they wish for that, but they also were able to see two uh, very driven parents who, um, y you know, who, who, we just had to make sacrifices as a family together. Just, we weren't going to have everything at the same time, but we had a beautiful home and they had plenty of um, great things to eat and they weren't yeah. spoiled from a, they, you know, they sure they had video games and they had um, all that they needed, but we, we weren't a family who um, needed the labels or the, or the, you know, $500 Gucci shoes. We weren't that kind of family. Mm -hmm. we, we had what we needed we lived um well but we didn't we didn't um we yeah, didn't to show of off and, yeah mm -hmm. okay no that's uh yeah. i mean that's important i think if you can find the the right balance especially with that when you're like having a, a good lifestyle but not uh not too shiny i would say but that's uh that's really great um right. i have another question which is like much more um you know like going back to the sales part yeah <laughs> So, because you 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 also joined Eloqua as one of the first employees, um, and I did. Um, like there's uh, some people are asking because we have uh, quite a lot of salespeople who are doing demos, especially like SaaS demos, uh, and they're asking like, um, what was your strategy after a demo? So let's say like you've shown first of all like because I think there is several strategy when you do a demo. Some people show the product, others don't. So first is where you showing the product, why and why not. And second is uh, what was the action you were actually doing after the demo? Like, because the follow-ups for me, I think they're the most important. So how were you structuring everything after that? Yeah, so I was fortunate that as a rep at Salesforce, I used the product, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> so I was using Salesforce yeah, and I nice. could show how I used Salesforce as a rep at Salesforce. I was also very fortunate that as a rep at Salesforce, I was using Eloqua. Mm. A lot of people don't know that. So okay. my first territory at Salesforce was Canada. Now, remember, Salesforce was a U.S.-based Bay Area, very small company. I had the whole country of Canada as my territory. <laughs> nice. Which is how I met Eloqua, because Eloqua was headquartered in Toronto. Oh, okay. Eloqua had 10 employees at the time, but Eloqua had a product that they showed me. Now, remember as a rep, I'm very curious, right? I'm a businesswoman, So I wanted to know as much about Eloqua as I wanted to know about my own product Salesforce. And they were very smart in the way that they engaged me. 
right? There was a lot of, and if we go back to the article reprints that I talked about, the, the on the wall with the paper and I could put it in an envelope and send it in the mail to someone, they showed me how I could take those article reprints and turn them into email templates. Nice. <laughs> now this is pre any of the tools yeah, like yeah, yours yeah, yeah. <laughs> or any of the, even the, the marketing email wasn't yeah. a thing back then. Remember 20 years ago in 2000, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -mm. this was way before email was ruined as, <laughs> as a communication channel. Um, so they were showing me how I could use Eloqua. And in fact, as a rep at Salesforce, I sent Mark Benioff an email I had built and sent in Eloqua. Nice. And he sent me an email saying, get every sales rep using this. <laughs> nice. So when I was at Eloqua, I was able to demo how I was mm. using Eloqua. Nice. So I wasn't demoing necessarily from a feature function. Yeah. Let me go through the list of features and all mm -hmm. the functionality. Yeah. I was showing a use case yeah. of how I actually leveraged the platform. Nice. And it, keeping it really condensed, don't show functionality that the customer hasn't, the buyer hasn't signaled that they're interested in. Right. So, so don't, because I think oftentimes we, we want to show everything that we have. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, one more thing, one more thing, one more thing. <laughs> you know what? That's not actually that interesting to yeah. them. <laughs> if you're talking about integration with Salesforce and they don't use Salesforce. It doesn't make sense, yeah. Mm. You're, you're, you're actually showing them something in negative. If mm. you're talking about an enterprise security model and they're not an enterprise, you're actually showing them a negative. So I'm, you know, I'm just always think about it through the lens of the customer and what I think they would want to see. And by getting to know them before I actually jump into the demo, whether it's through a conversation, whether it's through the research that I do online, whether it's as, as more and more time pass, looking at their LinkedIn profiles and understanding what, what experience they had with other tools and technologies, like then applying that into the way that I would actually show the product. Um, so that, you know, and I would, I would do my own demos in the early days of, of Eloqua. We didn't have sales and I was employee number 13. Like I did everything, <laughs> right? <laughs> so that, I think that earned some credibility and trust that I could yep. actually use the product to Definitely. show I used it. Um, how do you follow up, right? It's, it's, it's really during the demo, listening for cues, right? Listening for, oh, could you actually show me that? Or... So how does that work? Or now Bob would really be interested. Bob, I would write down Bob. <laughs> like who the hell is Bob? I need to figure out who Bob is, right? Nice. If Bob's going to find that compelling, <laughs> I want to know who Bob is, right? And maybe take a screenshot and say, this is something that you can share with Bob, whatever mm -hmm. it is. Um, so, so and, and I will tell you, follow up. That's where a lot of salespeople fall down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They don't follow up. They don't yeah. follow through. They don't send what they promise to send. They get lazy. Mm. They forget, they stop trying, they move on, they get bored, right? If you're someone who follows up and follows through, that's going to set you apart from a lot of other salespeople, first and foremost. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent agree. I really like the, yeah. So for you, I think like there's um, this part of taking notes. I think it's for me, like the, the most important part I see like yes. um, within my team, I remember like we had uh, when I was onboarding like new people and okay, we, we were doing like gross meeting and I was like basically chatting about the important part of everything. And I, I saw everyone was listening, you know, they were happy, smiling, and then like no one was taking notes. And I was like, what's going on guys? <laughs> like seriously. <laughs> so I think like, yeah, in sales or pretty much everywhere, I think like so many people are lazy to take notes and you yes. can't remember everything. It's not possible. I mean, you can have yeah. a good memory, remember maybe like 80% 80, 80 would be already amazing, but if you don't take notes, you're going to miss out on so much information. Oh, let me just talk about that because yeah. I could, I could actually walk you over to my, my box. Um, I've been going through my notebooks, my career notebooks. I have all my notebooks from nice. my entire career. And when you know, I, I take really copious notes and 
looking back through my notebooks and trying to figure out what made me a great sales professional, it is the detail, the level of detail that I would take notes during customer conversations. And then I would, if they would mention that they were working with um, a marketing agency, boom, mm -hmm. I would then figure out who at that marketing agency I could connect with, Okay. right? If they mentioned that they were using another piece of technology, I would figure out who at that company I could connect with, right? To share notes, right? Nice. G2, Intel, mm -hmm. right? So the, the, the detail to the customer conversation. And then I traveled a lot because, you know, at Eloqua, fast forward, um, Eloqua was headquartered in Toronto. Every mm -hmm. quarter I was going from the Bay Area to Toronto. Um, I would take two to three notebooks with me and I would go back through my notebooks and it would remind me of the customer conversations. And then I would highlight things that I had said I would follow up with that maybe I hadn't, or it would, it would, it would spark something. It would trigger something that, you know, oh, I learned that piece of information. I could mm. go back to them with that piece of information. Um, when nice. I took notes, I would circle action items, like if, and it would say F U P and some people were, thought it was fuck up, but it was actually follow up. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like color code and figure out, I would star things, right? I would, I would just do visual, I am a visual person. So nice. my notebooks, like I would always travel with two to three notebooks at a time because I would always go back through every customer conversation and, and try to piece together new things that I had learned that could be helpful to then go back to that potential buyer. Nice. I think it's super interesting, especially because as a salesperson, you're going to do tons of demos. And normally, if your company is set up correctly, since you have like an ideal customer profile, you're going to see patterns. And yes. I think the more you take notes, the more things you can leverage from a customer to another one. And then, you know, like really help them. And the more you help them, the more value you provide. And hence, the happier they are usually. Well, and, and to that effect, too, at, at Eloqua, we were really good about voice of the customer and listening to the customer. We had, you know, NPS, Net Promoter Survey, mm -hmm. um, and we would survey our customers. And fortunately, the way we had things set up, those um, responses would be put into salesforce.com. And okay. so as, a, as an individual quota carrying sales rep at, at Eloqua, I was actually able to go in and see all of our customers' NPS scores. And I was able to actually read the comments of our customers' NPS scores. And I didn't just stay in my lane. I'm not a stay in my lane kind of person. Mm -hmm. Like my territory, my customers. No, I thought of every customer as my customer, as our customer. Yeah. I always operated as a shareholder rather than an individual quota carrying sales rep. Um, that just the, you know, for me as a, as a salesperson, I felt like I was the CEO of my, of my, you know, of my customers, but my customers were the customers of the company. Mm -hmm. So anyways, I would read through NPS um, surveys and on a good day, I'd say I need a dose of reality. So I'd read the, the negative ones. Like, where are we falling down? What are we not getting right? What, what are the, where are customers not happy with us? On a bad day, when I needed to pick me up, I'd read the positive ones. Like, where are we excelling? Who's really benefiting from this? Where are people getting value? Same thing with our customer um, awards. We, we implemented early on an annual customer awards and we would solicit um, submissions from our customers. I read them all. And what I would do is I would put this pattern recognition mind frame together. Like if I kept seeing that lead nurturing, lead nurturing was a really good thing that um, customers love to do with our technology, then I would, then I would lead with lead nurturing. Yeah. Right. And I would talk about specific customers who mm -hmm. go interestingly nurturing programs and I would tell stories, yeah. not mm -hmm. talk about feature function, but tell stories of how companies mm -hmm. use our product to do yeah. lead nurturing. It, yeah. it takes a lot of work. I mean, it's a lot of time that I would spend doing things that weren't in my job description, mm -hmm. but my job description was grow revenue. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I would do what I would need to do to be able to mm -hmm. earn the trust and credibility of potential buyers to be able to do my job, which is drive revenue. Yeah, I really like this approach. Like don't stay in the line, uh, do the extra mile for your customers. Like they're your customers and 
it's okay to say that you know you're in charge of them you're in charge of helping providing value even if it means like going and uh, doing things that are not usually in your job description because i think like that's also an issue you know with job description where people are are put into boxes uh, where you know like we want to say like okay your job is going to do sales prospecting and demos that's it no you're, you're actually like there are tons of more things you can do to to provide value we have like an interesting question uh, from the audience um, and i think you have a lot of knowledge around that so i think that the sponge analogy you said was uh, pretty like <laughs> interesting from people because i saw like a lot of people saying how do we find sponges for our team so since you've hired a lot of people how exactly would you find this uh, top profiles where are actually people, you know, with uh, not always, you know, a lot of experience, but who are willing to learn? How do you find this specific profile without, you know, having like um, kind of the bullshit that can go around of people saying, yeah, I love to learn. And then you hire them and nothing happens. Right. Yeah. I, I think you, you find those people in the unexpected areas too. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'll, I'll tell a story of a, a young woman. She's still in college. And I was doing a, a speech at a marketing operations cross-company alliance meeting, which why was I at a marketing operations cross-company alliance meeting? Um, because our buyers of our technology are in marketing ops, mm. right? So, so as a learner, be where your buyers are, be where they are offline at events, be where they are online in different communities, in different tweet chats, in different LinkedIn groups, in different wherever. Um, so she's at this event. This was two plus years ago. And she has the, the gumption to ask a question. And um, she's in university. She's at this marketing ops meeting. She then connects with me on LinkedIn and two years later, she's doing a job search and where I'm taking the time, she just stood out, right? Like she stood out to me and, and she follows through. And then we start to talk about what she's looking for in the job search. And I send her a link to a podcast. She actually listens to that podcast, comes back and comments on that mm. podcast, right? So, so, so it's that person who doesn't say I'm gonna learn it all, but actually shows, <laughs> shows. Yeah, okay. that they are. And mm -hmm. so it's for me, it's, it's give someone a link to an article, give someone a link to a mm -hmm. podcast, um, uh, ask them a question about and see, see yeah. what they come back with, mm -hmm. right? Ask yeah. them, what's the last thing you read about that topic? Mm -hmm. um, who's your favorite person in that area? Who's an expert in that area? Really try to understand is this something that, um, do, do, will they go the extra mile? Yeah. Right? Like, like, and, and I bet I, I, I have one of my sons, he's, he's, he's in technology. Um, he, he's in marketing and he, he, like, you tell him what to do and he'll do it. You, you give him a task, he'll get it done. And, and that's the way that, you know, in our household, you had chores and so you you had to get it done but what i'm encouraging and coaching him to do is stop getting it done and start making it happen right mm -hmm. yes you're you're the reliable guy you're going to get the task done but what i want you to start thinking differently is what needs to be done what could i be doing to add value that goes beyond scratching it off the list, yeah. right? You start visualizing, you start conceptualizing, you start having conversations, you take the initiative. Don't wait yeah. for someone to tell you what to do, how to do mm -hmm. it, when to do it, and with whom to do it. Yeah. Get out there and go <laughs> make it happen, <laughs> right? This one, the F is not for follow-up. <laughs> That's right. Right. <laughs> yes. Look. Yes, you can do this. Ah, right? I love like, that. <laughs> yes, this is a book written by a female entrepreneur who didn't want to go back into the corporate world after she had a child. She couldn't imagine going back into a world of work that was designed by men and for men. 
And she said, screw that. I'm not going back to corporate world. I'm going to start my own gig. I'm going to start my own gig and I'm going to scale my own gig. Nice. More than likely, she was raised reading a little book of manners for girls <laughs> rather than the book of manners for boys, which for boys, it's a game plan, a game plan for getting along with others. But yeah. for girls, it's about courtesy and kindness. <laughs> we wonder why we don't see more female leaders. Mm. It's because as children, we're conditioning our kids. We're putting them in boxes. We're, we're, we're socializing them to an expectation. And Gail, I don't, I don't, you know, forget it. If it's yeah. been done before, I don't want to do it. I want to do something that's right and possible and modern. Don't put me in a box. I don't see the box, right? Nice. Stop, stop doing what you're told to do and start using your freaking brain and doing what makes sense for your customers. For uh, your customers. Yeah. No, that's that's really, really cool. Actually, like um before getting back to that topic, because I think that's gonna be like one of the last questions uh, and uh, it's really important. So I want to spend a bit of time on it. But just um, highlighting like the few things that you said, because I really enjoyed it. So for me, because hiring, I think it's a challenge for a lot of companies, especially when you grow fast, you have to scale. Um, what you said and for me was striking. And I think that's something that anyone can apply is use the same approach as in sales. Whenever you ask a lot of questions to candidates in order to know what they like, what they're looking for, because you want to have people that match also your mindset, the company mindset, etc. Once you know what they like, find resources that are that can help them and see how they follow up on that resources because if you find what they like usually these people should read this i mean if, if for example i tell you i don't know like i love basketball i'm a huge fan if you send me an article about basketball like something very specific i will read it if i like it so that's really a great way to tell from people who are bullshitting with saying like yeah you know like i love sport team sport i'm like yeah hey, when they're not doing anything compared to people who actually have like true passion or like about something. So find what's interesting for them, have them follow up on that to see if they're the one doing the extra mile, if they're the one learning and that's how you're going to find your sponges. So coming back to you, because I think like what you said uh, about like usually like female leaders, et cetera, for me, it's, it's a bit crazy because if we look at the current words, we see a lot of uh, female SDRs were kind of outperforming men or like doing at least as good or sometimes and actually most of the time better than men. However, when you look at the leadership position, we don't see a lot of, uh, of women and I think it's, uh, it's really a shame. So what would you think is or like what things can we change to see like more women as a leadership in sales and how, what can we do basically? Like what should we say? What can we do? Yeah, I think... Um... Uh, first, let me say that I had an epiphany not too terribly long ago that although I was always an individual quota carrying sales rep, I didn't become a manager, a director, a vice president, a senior vice president, a chief revenue officer. That was not my career path. I did not climb the leadership ladder in the traditional sense. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean I wasn't a sales leader. I chose instead to lead my customers on their journeys. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to rise through the leadership ranks internally yeah. because of what that responsibility looked like. That was less fun okay. than being on the front line with my customers. So it, it, it took me a while to reconcile that although I didn't climb the leadership ladder, the traditional leadership ladder, yeah. I was every bit of a sales leader. I just chose to lead my customers. Nice. So I want people to know that you don't have to aspire to internally climb the leadership ladder yep. to be a leader. 
That's yeah. first and foremost. I think um, like there's maybe like, a, sorry to interrupt, but maybe like a, a nice parallel here because, you know, like um, if you look at businesses in general, you would have like, a, you would start as a SDR and then, you know, like people say, okay, I need to become an AE, then maybe a VP sales or head of sales, et cetera. But actually like for me, sales is more of an art. And if you look at, for example, carpenters, they're, gonna, they're not going to say like, okay, I'm starting Carpenter and in five years I become head of Carpenters or VP of Carpenters. It doesn't make sense. Like some people spend years and years mastering their art and become really excellent at it. And I think it's not, you know, like this ladder for me doesn't make sense because it puts people, you know, as a level, like you're beneath me. And I think it doesn't make sense. So yeah, great point and 100% aligned with you. Well, I made more money than yeah. <laughs> the sales managers, the sales directors, the sales VPs. So you know, my, my highest W2 year at, at Eloqua, now time adjusted, was over $600,000 in <laughs> you know, TCE. And then I had, you know, had $600,000 a year, I had $550,000 a year, a $500,000 a year, a $450,000 a year. And then on the equity side, when Eloqua was acquired by Oracle, I had a $2 million payout from the equity not too in, bad <laughs> I, not too bad at all mm -hmm. right and i'm not afraid to talk about money yeah. a lot of people think it's tacky to talk about money i don't think it's tacky because yeah, I, so. I believe if you can see it you can be it yeah and so true. back to the how do we get more women into mm -hmm. traditional internal leadership roles yeah. they need to see more women in those roles that they okay. can identify with that they that they that they like what those women are doing that they that they like the roles and responsibilities and the pressure and um there's a woman in my network um it's her story to share so i won't say who she is but when i was a you know a, a, an ae at eloqua she was an sdr she came in as a as a junior sdr she worked her way up she became a named account exec um she then when Eloqua was acquired by Oracle, she got promoted up the leadership ranks and then she got recruited away and she was the chief revenue officer of a global company. And so she had global responsibilities. She had young children and she hated it. Mm. She hated the fact that she was on 24 seven in a global role with no you know, break from a time zone perspective, global international travel. And she said, screw it, it's not worth it. And now she's back to being an individual quota carrying sales rep, closing seven figure deals, making more money <laughs> and a better lifestyle yeah. for, yeah. For, her, for her life. So I just want, it, it, there, there's, more, there's more than one path to mm -hmm. be a leader yeah. and you choose who you want to lead. But if that is the path that you wanna take, go for it, right? But find other women who have successfully risen through those leadership ranks and figure out what it is they had to sacrifice, the trade-offs that they made and the skills and the network and the knowledge that they needed to actually be successful at that, at that leadership, traditional leadership ranking. Yeah, no, 100% agree. I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's really like uh, the, the vision we have of success is also the same thing as putting people into box, you know, like success is what matters to you. It's not what people think or this type of thing. So yeah, it's uh no, no it's, it's very cool. I'm just going to check because it's, uh, it's been almost an hour. Time flies. It does. <laughs> I don't wanna, it sure does. I don't want to take too much of your time. I just want to see if there is maybe like a, one more question from the audience. Um, one uh, thing, G, let yeah. me, while you're doing that, yeah. I think it's important to really care about what you're selling. Okay. And I think it's important to care about the people to whom you're selling and to be passionate about what you're selling. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I learned as much about being a professional salesperson, read as many sales books and sales training books and did sales training classes as I read about marketing because I was selling into marketing. Yeah. And I think the, the more time you spend in a specific industry, vertical, um, the, the, the more that you become expert at it, the more value that you can add to your customers. Um, but if you're not passionate about it, get out. 
right? Yeah. I was doing a conversation with um, uh, the big ID sales team and they've got security privacy um, solutions in this GDPR world. Um, and I'm like, if you're not, if you're not a nerd about data and security yeah. and privacy, then don't be selling for big yeah, find, ID. Find something else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Find something that you're passionate about yeah. because I, I don't want to sell something that I don't believe in that I wouldn't actually see value in myself. Yeah. No, 100% agree with that. I think it makes, as you said, again, like, uh, you know, when you were sharing your stories about like how, you know, you're, uh, you were using Eloqua uh, when you were working at Salesforce, I think it's super powerful. Actually, like, uh, Last question we have, uh, it's from uh, our head of business development that we just hired. It's quite funny because she's been a, a Lemlist user for the last 10 months in her company. Yeah. She was managing like a lot of salespeople there and she was using it a lot. So for us, it's a bit similar story. I'm like, cool, you're going to be able to share your story. So that's nice. Um, she's talking about like um, discrimination in general. So yeah because sales uh, is dominated, I think a lot with uh, kind of male and we see a lot of, you know, like, um, oh, actually there's a quote you said that I really enjoyed. Uh, okay, I didn't ring the bell when a contract closed, but instead pop the champagne when my clients achieve value. I really, really like that because again, when I thought about like, you know, a team of men sales, uh, you know, like ringing the bell, high five, we love sports, uh, doing like analogies about sport when no one understand them apart them. Like it's, it's sometimes like you can see a lot of discrimination. So how do you handle discrimination? How do you, you know, like um, find the, the right spot? How do you, you know, like um, do your job, you know, in a, in a healthy environment when there is still like uh, discrimination? Yeah. You know, I even tweeted about this this morning. Um, I, I either A... I, I think a lot of, I just don't fall into it. I don't fall victim to it. Okay. And um, I, I, I move beyond it. I don't let it get in the way. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've definitely, I, I'm a female. I think I'm relatively attractive. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I keep myself in shape. Um, I leverage that. Right. So if I'm in a room full of men, I'm not trying to like, like, I'm not doing, <laughs> I, I, but I, but I'm going to leverage my, 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 my attractiveness and my presence and my, my passion to earn attention. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. not from a dumb brunette perspective, yeah. but from a smart businesswoman perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think part of, you know, my customer, I didn't sell into IT. I didn't sell into all male dominated um, industry. I, a lot of my, my buyers, about half and half were male and female. So from that perspective, I wasn't selling into an all male world, mm -hmm. um, which I think was helpful. But, um, but I, I, I just don't let it, I don't let it define me, right? Okay. I don't, I don't, I don't fall victim to it. I don't, I just keep going. Right. And, and, and when, 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 when it crosses the line, I'm not afraid to say, Hey, you that no, slow down Sparky. Yeah. Homie doesn't play that. Right. I'm, I, 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 I'm not afraid to use my voice. Um, it doesn't mean I haven't been discriminated against. It doesn't mean I haven't been harassed. Um, but, and, and it doesn't mean that when I've reported the harassment that, um, it hasn't been taken seriously, that, that, that has happened to me mm -hmm. where I've reported the harassment and no, no action, no disciplinary, disciplinary action has been taken. And that's hard to, that's, that's hard yeah. to swallow, mm -hmm. but I can either continue to, um, fight the battle if I want, or choose to put it behind me. Okay. And I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't, I, I don't live in the past. I'm, I'm, we're just going to keep, we're going to keep fighting for change. We're going to keep yeah. trying to enlighten people to do the right thing. So I know that's not the perfect answer, but I just don't let it, I don't, I don't fall victim to it. Okay. Okay. No, I mean, I think it's, uh, I think it's important, you know, like uh, 
looking toward the future also is a, is a good mindset, not living in the past, you know, like only change the thing that you can actually change is super important. And uh, no, that's definitely important. It's important to talk about it also generally, just because maybe it helps people get more aware about it. So no, that's really, really cool. We've been uh, a bit <laughs> going over time, but uh, to be honest, thanks a lot, Jill. It was really amazing uh, talking to you. Um, how, what's the best way for people to follow you, follow your updates? Yeah, so I'm not as active as I have been in the past. Um, this was a conversation that I, that I don't do a lot of anymore. I just, I, I love, I've loved our time. You did exactly what I would have done when I was, you know, in your shoes, you personalized the outreach you related to me, you came prepared, um, you've taken all the friction out of making this possible. You didn't make it overly self-promotional. And I just, I don't, I want to add value. I'm not as much about Jill Rowley and, oh my God, you got to follow me and I'm amazing. Like <laughs> I just, I, I'm beyond that. Um, yeah. But I do, I'm very still active on Twitter. Okay. Um, a lot of what I, the, the things I share are more around venture capital and startups mm -hmm. yeah. because I'm more heavily involved in that than in like traditional selling anymore. But I definitely, I'll never, ever leave my MarTech B2B marketing ops peeps. I love those people. I love sales enablement peeps. Um, so you'll see me engage with people and share content in that area. So on Twitter, I'm at Jill underscore Rowley, R-O-W-L-E-Y. Um, on LinkedIn, um, again, I'm not publishing a whole lot of content, but I, I do engage with OPC, other people's content. Um, I try to find really cool content that I think my, my um, network would like, and I share that, and I engage in conversation. So LinkedIn, um, Twitter, and then... Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> no, I'm not really great. on Instagram and I'm not really on Facebook <laughs> and yeah. So LinkedIn and Twitter are the places to find me. That's awesome. Thanks a lot for your time, Jill. Have an amazing day and take care.